my name is Maria and I'm here today to talk about my experience as a woman with ADHD. In particular, a woman who's had a late diagnosis of ADHD as well. For me, ADHD impacts me in very different ways. Firstly, the sensory issues that can come with ADHD have been massive in my life. Noisy environments and sometimes the feelings of anxiety they can cause. Sometimes the feeling of fabrics as well, like socks being a bit too tight, are very hard to uh, sort of ignore during the day. Also, aspects of visual distractions, maybe even a busy environment, but more so because of the visual and how that also impacts me. Indeed, when I was at secondary school, the transition from primary into secondary school and that much bigger environment and busier one at that had a real impact on me at the time. And I think that's when I started to question whether there was some reason there that I found those things difficult. Again, when I was at secondary school though, these things weren't really talked about as much, and especially not ADHD, and especially not ADHD in women. Secondly as well, when you have ADHD, your feelings can be um, so much more keen in how they're felt. So it might be that I might get overly emotional sometimes, and it's hard to explain why that is. If there's a dog advert that's quite sad on TV, I'm probably gonna well up at it. <laughs> so wherever other people might not understand that, those emotions can be felt a lot st more strongly. Also, hyperactivity. Now, it's often thought that hyperactivity is a physical restlessness or need for movement. It's also a very mental thing. It's almost like having too many tabs open at once. And I've definitely struggled with that all through my life. And that can include overthinking, over planning, um, and just struggling to switch off. And I think that's one of the major things for me in how ADHD has impacted me. Also, I'm quite an impatient person. I don't like to admit it, but I am. And you know, if something's coming up, I'm really gonna look forward to it. I want it to come even faster. Or again, being in a traffic jam, it's not the easiest to cope with when you've got ADHD. But again, as life has gone on, there's been strategies for that, which I'll talk about a bit later on. Socially as well is an area that sometimes um, has impacted me in the past. Maybe questioning conversations. Oh, did I interrupt? Should I have said something different? and just feeling generally different to those around me has been quite tricky. And finally, the kind of need for stimulation. So if I am in a lesson, in, or I was in a lesson in secondary school that I really enjoyed, say history, great, you've got my focus. If it's something like maths and it's not engaging to me, or there's not a subject that I'm interested in to do with that, I'm less likely to be engaged. And again, the need for stimulation could be as simple as needing to move and having movement to keep myself engaged or focused. So there's some of the main ways that ADHD has impacted me during my life as a female. Now, a lot of people will ask, why does it look different or why does it present differently in females to males? Now, I feel like um, even now in a lot of ways, neurodiversity doesn't have enough exposure. And fast forward 20 years, more than that, um, it wasn't always talked about enough and especially not ADHD. Now, being female also, it wasn't something that was thought um, would be the case, that females would have ADHD. It was seen generally as naughty teenage boys that was a condition for them, not females. And unfortunately, those negative stereotypes have really impacted females gaining a diagnosis. Now, other stereotypes as well have included, maybe people with ADHD won't be as intelligent, which is an awful thing to think. Or those with ADHD are always naughty. Not necessarily, definitely not the case. So how education has deemed those things, people can't sit still. That means they're naughty, not at all. So. When it comes to females, I found for myself being a very um, academically able female meant that I wasn't really looked at for ADHD. My behaviour was generally good. All of those things, I think, really did lead to me not being looked into for a diagnosis. Add on top of that, I was in a grammar school as well. And those negative associations of um, neurodiversity and that labels can be a negative thing, um, meant that my school, I don't think, looked at them very much at all in females um, in my school, unfortunately. Also, the kind of associations around people being different can lead to females especially suppressing and masking their symptoms a lot more. So even though I felt hyperactive in a lesson, it wouldn't be that I could move about and jump about or maybe be noisy because it wouldn't have been allowed. However, I would be constantly writing very quickly that movement and the use of the pen was helping me to focus or be stimulated. 
or perhaps trying not to talk to a friend too much because again, that need for stimulation or conversation um, would have helped me. But there was a lot of suppressing of symptoms. And also shame within that as well, being aware that there's difference, not knowing how or why. And for those behaviours to not be seen as good, a lot of shame came with that as well. And a lot of those reasons are why it was very much not um, identified in females. So it's a really sad thing. Other areas of difficulty as well, in particular from having ADHD. For me, as I mentioned there, it was always feeling a little bit different. Now, different isn't a bad thing. Connotations of it as well can be feeling weird, not feeling normal, maybe even feeling stupid. Those feelings that get internalised because you don't really cope as well at certain things as others do are really difficult to um, hold on to and process. Equally, habits that I had that maybe people found annoying um, really impacted on me, especially when I couldn't help them. Things like whistling, needing to move, singing, talking a lot. Again, apologies if I'm talking very quickly now. But all those things that other people might have said to me, can you not do that? Can you just stop that? Can you just... They translated to me as bad habits. But actually, that might have been elements of stimming or me regulating my system, allowing for movement, allowing for stimulation, and also the release of dopamine and good hormones from things like singing or moving that should have been allowed. Additionally, a lot of um, neurodiverse conditions, especially ADHD, can show signs of anxiety as well. So it has at times made me feel anxious. It might make me want to plan ahead. Again, the aspect of impatience definitely makes me want to plan ahead and look forward to things that are coming up as well. But that's there and that inability to switch off can sometimes translate as anxiety. So that is another tricky thing. Also, there's a lot of stereotypes again around ADHD. And one of them is that we always have a lot of energy. Now, people with ADHD can struggle with fatigue. Absolutely. When your mind is constantly going and thinking about things, physically you need to move. Of course, we're going to experience fatigue. And that's been another difficulty for me. In addition as well, having a strong sense of justice or maybe being a little too honest has maybe, maybe have a few trip ups as time's gone on. Um, and again, socially, that has impacted things occasionally in the workplace as well. And finally, my comfort zone is very important to me, as it can be for neurotypicals. But those who are neurodiverse can find it very tricky to push ourselves out of it. Now, depending on the type of ADHD someone, someone has, if it's impulsive, maybe that's okay. And those new experiences are very thrilling and enjoyable. But for some, the comfort zone and what is in our control is really important to us. And it can make it harder to step out of it without being able to plan it enough. There are a lot of crossovers with ADHD and autism, for instance. Um, and that's not always known about either. So it's really having a look at some of those areas of difficulty. But that's how they've presented for me. Now... As you can imagine, all of those difficulties or presentations have a huge impact on self-esteem. For me, as I said before, it's feeling different or weird. Definitely. Strange to my peers at secondary school, I think I stayed off quite a lot because I felt so different, kind of uncomfortable in the environment, knowing there was a reason for feeling different but not really knowing what. That conversation just wasn't out there then. Also, there's a feeling of feeling generally less than not good enough, maybe less deserving because of some of those bad habits or, you know, put my foot in it for being too honest. And also a lot of a sense of embarrassment as well. Even now there might be things I reflect on for, from secondary school, for instance, and there's a feeling of embarrassment, but I know why now, and that helps. Now, fast forward a little bit though to my diagnosis. I am 31 now and I am um, sought some help from the ADHD Foundation um, last year. I've worked as a teacher for a number of years, and particularly with those who are neurodiverse. I got a really a, a real affinity with some of the young people I worked with, and I really wanted to champion them. And I came to realise that actually, maybe some of those feelings wasn't just me as a practitioner, but also that I could see something in them that I felt in myself. So I sought support from the ADHD Foundation. I got a QB test and the results were there. The QB test as well revealed that I was quite hyperactive. And although I realized that in myself, I don't think I realized quite how much I had a lot of physical movement and needed to do that. And again, that mental hyperactivity that I'd always felt, there was a reason for it. So 
it's been a massive, massive recalibration of my life, like having a new lens to find out that there was a reason that I struggled with things that other people found easy. There was a reason that I felt different, but different is not less than or worse. So I've given myself a lot of forgiveness because of the diagnosis. I've also had to learn to forgive others that, you know, may have missed it. Teachers in secondary school, other practitioners that I worked with, they maybe didn't see the signs, but it simply wasn't looked for, especially in females. Also, I am no longer sort of settling for less. That feeling of, um, you know, being less deserving because of being different, that's gone out the window. So since finding out that I had ADHD, although I will have had coping strategies in place already, some that I use a lot more is actually harnessing aspects of hyperfocus. Those activities that I like to do and I can really focus on them, it makes sense to do them. One of those for me was writing. When I really focused on it, I wrote a book <laughs> and hopefully it's not been too bad because I've got an agent for it. So harnessing that, harnessing the energy as well. Put that physical energy into something you enjoy, whether it's dance, yoga, rugby, whatever it might be that you enjoy. Harness it, okay? Nothing wrong with that at all. Also, um, as it can be quite difficult to be in the present with ADHD, as I say, those aspects of um, impatience or planning ahead. I use a lot of grounding techniques for myself now to just check in and make sure I'm in the present moment. That could be things like the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 method. Five things you can see, four things you can physically feel, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. If you find that your mind's wandering, it just brings you right back into the environment you're in. Also my mindset as well, you know, making sure that I'm thinking positively and telling myself good things. Because again, that kind of shame could have been internalized and it can take a while to change those, mind, those thoughts and that mindset. But doing it continually, it will lead to good results. Trying as well, you know, to um, give myself permission to feel those things. If I have sensory overwhelm, for instance, that's okay. I know why, I might need support, I might need to manage it in that moment, but that's okay. It's not a bad thing at all. Finally, um, I know a lot of people talk about medication as well, um, but for me, I've not really felt that I necessarily needed it and it's not something I've explored, but I know people who do find it really beneficial. And you know, that's another strategy there to cope with some of the sort of presentations of ADHD. So um, another thing is lifestyle, you know, making sure that we're eating the right things. When we've got ADHD, we might have 50% less iron in our systems, which can leave us tired. Make sure we're doing that. Make sure we're taking the right vitamins. Make sure we're trying to get enough sleep. I know it can be difficult with ADHD, but looking after ourselves and also making sure we've got enough play as well as work is really important. And finally, just as um, a final point to round off um, this video, you know, my ADHD doesn't define me, but it's a part of me now. And knowing that has really helped me to have understanding and self-acceptance. And finally, to be true to who I am. And it's so freeing to not mask a lot of those signs or trying to stop myself from talking about special interests or whatever it might be anymore. I really feel like I am the Maria I should have been. And there's been so much... Um, so, well, so many benefits to that since it happened. So I hope this video has been really useful for you looking at ADHD in women. And I wish you all of luck if you also are pursuing um, a diagnosis in ADHD or just looking into it a little bit more. Thank you. Hey!